If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 51. Now what? Making my way through the battlefield, I slowly made my way to where Jane and Julius were looking over the battlefield, in amazement of our achievement just like I had done. Stepping over the corpses, I made sure not to accidentally step on the bodies of the newly deceased. Finally reaching them, I stopped and looked out at the field of bodies. I have seen many wars and battles fought, but this was my first time taking part in one. I said. I don't think it's for me. Julius said, in almost a whisper. Did you see the kids? Jane asked us. I turned to look at her. I think so, maybe a couple, I didn't think about it, I just kept swinging my sword at anything in front of me. I wish I could say the same, but I had to think and see to use my powers. Julius said. When I had to tear them apart, or when I bashed them together, I had to watch. He said. Turning to him, I spoke. Well, they weren't really there anymore, so don't feel bad. I said to him. What do you mean? They weren't really there. Jane asked. Children who have been turned, are more impulsive and less capable of self-control compared to adult vampires, and are even more vulnerable to their vampiric instincts. Their thirst for blood is all that drives them forward, like a person dying of thirst in the desert, all they can think about is the liquid that could sedate their thirst, which for them is blood. I said. We went quite again, just sitting there looking out at the destruction we had caused, and thinking about the fight. Jane's head turned and looked out to our side. You did it. Jane said, as she saw the burning bodies of Stefan and Alec. I nodded my head. Yes, he's gone. She sat there dead still for a moment, watching the burning flames, before speaking again. Thank you. She said in a sad tone. I looked at her. There's no need to thank me, he didn't deserve what he got, but at least now he can be at peace. Jane slowly nodded her head and we all went quiet again. After a few moments Julius spoke. What now? He asked, breaking the silence that surrounded us. A wicked smile spread across my face. Now, I'm going to go talk to the Vulturi, then we are going to go see all those things I told you about. Both Jane's and Julius's heads shot in my direction. Really? Jane said excitedly, dispersing the shroud of sadness that once surrounded her. Really? Now while I'm gone, why don't the two of you decide where you want to go first? I said with a chuckle, as I turned to start heading up the hill I had last seen the vulturi standing on. Stepping over bodies and body parts, I finally made it to the top of the hill, where I saw the last few remaining vampires milling about around a large tent that was recently put up, while in the distance, I could see the last surviving human blood bags, being guarded by just one vampire. Reaching the tent, I swung open the tent flap and stepped inside. The inside of the tent was dark with very little amounts of light creeping through the fabric tent. Inside sat the three vulturi heads, all sitting around a circle wooden table, and in ornate chairs. Behind them stood two of their personal guards, who gave me death stares as I stepped in. I instantly saw the tightening around Aro's eyes, and the tension in Marcus and Caius' bodies, at my appearance. They are still tensed up after my little reminder, I gave them. I thought with a chuckle. I honestly can't blame them, one minute they were kings the next I was tearing them apart, breaking the illusion they had of them being invincible. Arrow was the first to speak. Ah, if it isn't the savior of the battle. He said, with a hint of a sneer hidden under his complimenting words. Yes, it's me, and you're welcome. I said with a chuckle at his words. I'm just stopping by to tell you this is where we separate, and I and my coven members go our own way. I said. And also where I bring you another warning. I added. Arrow raised an eyebrow. And that would be? He asked. I stepped forward until I was standing right in front of the round table they were seated at, and looked Arrow dead in the eyes. I will stay out of your way, as long as you stay out of mine, you can do as you wish with the vampiric world as long as you stay away from my coven and myself, and if you decide that it is a good idea to come for me and my coven, I won't give you a warning, and I won't hold back like I did to you, I will come for you and I will kill all of you. I said in almost a whisper. I saw a flash of fear and anger run through Aro's eyes, before he slowly nodded his head. I saw that Caius wanted to open his mouth and say something, but my eyes flashed in his direction and I stared him in the eyes, giving him a warning with my cold glare. When they didn't say anything, I turned on my heels and started for the exit, not giving them time to say anything that might piss me off. Stepping out of the tent, I let my eyes adjust to the light before going to grab our packs, 
then head back to Jane and Julius. Now laden down with all our packs I slowly made my way back to Jane and Julius, who were now sitting on the hilltop and still looking over the battlefield. Have you figured out where the both of you would like to go first? I asked them, as I reached where they were seated. Julius turned his head and looked at me. Yes we have. He said, in a happy tone. Dropping their packs on the damp ground I asked. And where would that be? With a smile on his face he said. To the east, to the other ocean, Julius said. Really? I said in surprise. Yes, I always wanted to go, Julius said. Those stories you told us sounded very interesting, and we would love to see the culture there. Jane added. I nodded my head. Sure, we can take the Silk Road straight there. I said as I thought of the best path to take. Looking back at the battlefield Julius asked. What is going to happen to all the bodies? I thought for a moment before saying. More than likely, they are just going to burn all of them. I said with a shrug. Jane looked up at me. Won't they try to put them back together? She asked. Possibly, but there are so many broken limbs and body parts down there, it would be almost impossible to find which part goes to who. The Vulturi will more than likely just start over again, but maybe with fewer vampires, it's not like they really have any enemies left. Except you, Julius added. Except me I chuckled. We have a bit of an understanding. They keep the vampires under control and I don't wipe out their race. I said with a huff. Jane looked up at me again. You would take out the vampire race? She asked. I let out a laugh. Maybe, if they get out of hand, sure. The only reason I haven't is because most vampires are just trying to survive, like the rest of us, and they aren't insane sycophantic a-holes like the Romanian coven was, who kill for fun, but instead kill to survive. She nodded her head at that. Now I don't know about the both of you, but I'm ready to get going, the less time we spend around the vulturi the better. I said, picking up my pack and putting it on my back. Jane and Julia soon followed my lead, and grabbed their own packs. Once we were set, and ready to go, I stopped and looked out at the field of dead bodies one last time. As I looked out at the field, the clouds for the first time in almost two weeks opened, and a ray of sunlight shone through and onto the battlefield causing the broken limbs, and bodies of the dead vampires to sparkle brightly. It's strange. Julius said, from beside me. Looking over at him I asked. What is? I gestured with his chin, at the now sparkling field. How something that only moments ago was a scene of death, destruction, and carnage, can now look so magical. Chapter 52, East The trip to the East, and into Asia was a long journey. With our constant stops at anything we found interesting, or if we just felt like relaxing for a few days, it's not like we had anywhere to be at the moment. We decided to go by land instead of sea, so we could see the world around us instead of the constant blue of the sea. The experience was incredible for both Jane and Julius alike. Julius might be 600 years old, but all he has ever seen was Rome, Alexandria and our home in England, but other than that, he was a clean slate, as well as Jane. On our travels east we stopped at some of the most important places. First at Constantinople. Then we stopped and saw the massive walls of Babylon. Then continued east, going from city to city. Along the way, I picked up my old habit of trading. And before you knew it, we had a camel, who Jane named Joshua, who carried some silks and herbs. And a donkey, who was truly an ass. The thing would bite anyone who got close to it. We didn't even bother to name him. Jane and Julius had a bet going to see how long it would take before I killed him myself. Cough moving on. With my new fire burning inside me we continued on our journey east. Town to town, or city to city, we went, without a care in the world, just enjoying our lives to the fullest. While we were on our travels I came across a first for me in this world. A Bible. The Bible was written in Hebrew, so I had a little trouble reading it, Hebrew not being one of my main languages of speaking so I had become rather rusty at it. But as I continued to read it the more it came back to me, and the more I understood of the book. As I read, I came across the story of Adam and Eve. Reading the story, I wasn't surprised at what happened. From when they ate the apple from the tree of knowledge, to being kicked out of the Garden of Eden. As well as what God did when he kicked them out of Eden. But what differed from the original Bible, was the discrimination of Adam himself. In the original Bible, there wasn't much of a discrimination of either Adam or Eve. 
instead the story mostly focuses on the creation of human beings and their relationship with God. The appearance of Adam is not mentioned in detail in the biblical account. But in this Bible there was an actual detailed description of him. Tall, pale skin, and hair like snow, oh fuck I thought as I read the first few words of the description. You have got to be kidding me. I said to myself, as I sat beside a small fire, in the middle of a desert, in what will become Afghanistan. At the moment, both Jane and Julius were off hunting for any wildlife there might be in the desolate mountains, leaving me to sit and tend the fire. Which I didn't mind because it gave me time to read. But now, I am a little afraid. This can't be real, can it, me, a part of what will be the biggest religion in the world, as the first human. Pushing down the wild thoughts that erupted at even the thought of that being true, I continued to read. The story continued after the banishment of Adam and Eve, like normal. Toil of work for Adam, and birth to her for Eve. But what really changed things was that the story continued to Adam and Eve's first two sons Cain and Abel, and where Cain kills Abel in a fit of jealousy. But in this Bible Adam witnessed Abel's death, and in a rage, Adam killed his other son Cain. When God witnessed this act of anger, he cursed Adam, to become a wanderer of earth, to never die. After that the story continued. It went on to tell the story of how after the death of Eve and more of his children, Adam left to wander the world, to become known as the white-haired wanderer. Oh fuck, oh fuck. I thought, as my brain came to a sudden halt. Fuck, 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 I'm the Adam. I mentally panicked. My brain was turning with different emotions and thoughts as I stood and started walking around the fire in circles as I sorted out my thoughts. What could the repercussions from this be? I thought. It can't be much, right? After another hour of my mind slowly taking itself apart, I finally managed to calm down. It's not that big of a deal, I'm sure people won't be on the hunt for me or something. After that night, I continued to read the Bible, and saw that all that changed was Adam being cursed to wander the world instead of his son Cain. Continuing east, we finally made it to China. At the moment China is going through a golden period of stability, economically, and LN trade, under the Tang dynasty. We stayed in China for a little over seven months, where we traded and sold many of my goods, for Chinese silks and other items. While Julius and Jane, experience the culture. Once we decided to leave, we headed north, to see the Great Wall. Which for its time, or even in the future, is one hell of a work of engineering. For thousands of miles, they built a wall to protect them. Now that we were leaving, we took a bit of a roundabout way back east. First going north. We did some trading with the nomadic tribes, north of China, with some of the groups that would someday become Genghis Khan's army. Even though the Mongolians weren't at their peak yet, and were still separate nomadic tribes, they were still some very incredible hunters, horse riders, and bow users. Our first meeting with the first of the nomadic tribes was a little rocky, since I didn't know their language that well. But through hand gestures and pointing, they figured out I was here to trade. They were interested in Joshua our camel. Never before had they seen one. When I tried showing them how to ride one, it turned into a true fiasco, where there wasn't a single person there that could contain their laughter. To get onto the camel, Joshua had to lay down, so we could pull ourselves into the makeshift saddle I had bought to ride Joshua during our travels. The funny part came, when the person that was seated on Joshua's back, would freak out and fall off, when Joshua stood up. The movement and height always caused whomever was trying to ride him to panic and either jump off, or fall off his back. Thankfully Joshua was like a big puppy, and had fun watching people fall off of him. After we were done trading with that tribe of nomads, they brought us to another nomadic tribe where we once again traded goods, and where the tribe's men would try and ride Joshua, but nobody could manage it. For another few months we continued going from tribe to tribe selling and trading. On one of my trades I managed to get my hands on one of their bows, at the moment the bow wasn't like what it will become which was a short bow that has incredible power, but you could certainly see that it was on its way to become the incredible weapon it will become. I actually found shooting the bow to be quite fun. Of course I had to be careful when using it, because with my strength, pulling the bow which only had a 100 pound pull weight was for me like pulling a bungee cord, and I could accidentally pull back too hard and break the bow in half. Put it was always a small rush when I hit a bull's eye shot, at a good distance. Leaving the nomadic tribes we started going back west where we stopped in India. Just like in China, India was currently going through a period of prosperity, even though it was currently split into two kingdoms, Rashtrakuta dynasty slash Pratihara dynasty, 
the whole region was still having a large growth in their economy, and other areas, like mathematics and science. For almost a year we stayed in India. We didn't mean to but there truly were some incredible cultural things to see there, where every day we could find something new to explore. Chapter 53, I Didn't Do It 916 AD 4916 years in the world To move the plot forward and get to a particular historical point, this chapter will contain a few quick time jumps. Now, perched on a wooden stool, I was painting the breathtaking scenery in front of me with a paintbrush. Right now, I was painting a gorgeous dawn over a mountain crest while sitting in a forest in the Italian Alps. I dipped my brush into my homemade paint and started painting the canvas. As I painted I couldn't help but let out a chuckle as I thought, Leonardo da Vinci who. After returning from our almost decade-long journey to wherever we felt like going, we returned to England. But the reason I am currently sitting atop a mountain is that during our return home, Jane and Julius had finally become a couple, and let's just say, living in the same house as them, wasn't the best choice at the moment. So deciding to give them time to get all of their pent-up love out of the way, I decided to start working on a new passion of mine. Painting. I got the idea after selling all of the items I had accumulated over our journeys that we didn't want to keep. Including our cart that the ass who shall not be named, used to pull. The person I sold the car to was a painter of great skill. This surprised me, because the dude could really paint, I didn't remember his name ever being known in the future, or ever seeing one of his works of art, which must mean he was one of the many lost to time, as just another painter to never be known. After seeing the masterpieces in his shop, I decided to give it a shot. With my better than normal noggin on my shoulders, I became quite skilled at it, within a quick amount of time. Turning what was meant to be something I could do to pass the time for a while as Jane and Julius finished, their, uh, business. Into something I genuinely enjoyed and spent a number of years doing. I started going all over Rome and Italy itself painting anything and everything I wished. Spending a few years just dedicating myself to it. Year 1022. At the moment I was playing a game of Nefateful with King Nut. As to why or how I am currently in the presence of a king and playing a board game with a king, well... For the first time in a while, I decided to actually take part in my bank's business. King Nut was the ruler of parts of Normandy and half of England. And at the moment his kingdom is in a bit of a pinch. The raids from Vikings have drawn significantly from his treasuries, with him having to pay more soldiers than needed, and also employing mercenaries to patrol their costs. And so, he asked our bank for a loan, and of course, we said sure. So with me back in England, and not doing anything, I decided why not and met him in person to straighten out the details of the loan. And through the making of a deal, the two of us actually become friends. King Nut was actually a very interesting person. He was smart, just, and looked out for the people under his rule. Most of the time we just played board games or talked about his lands, and ways he could better help his citizens. To him I was an heir of a chain of banks that spanned different countries. And well, just like any king would do, he asked me if I wished to be a duke of his kingdom. But I passed on the offer. The idea of being held down in one place just didn't sit right with me, being tied down where I would have responsibilities and be forced to stay and take care of my lands, was something I tried to avoid. King Nut moved one of his pieces on the board, leaving himself open for defeat. Leaning forward in my chair, I moved one of my own pieces, taking out one of his and putting him at a loss. You always win, when will you ever let me win? King Nut said playfully. When you are skilled enough to beat me. I responded jokingly. King Nut scoffed and took a sip from a goblet of wine. I will be having dinner with my wife Emma this evening, would you like to join use? He asked me. I shook my head. As pleasant as that sounds, I must be off, I said standing from my chair. Of course. Nut said standing from his own chair to see me off. Leaving for home, I looked up at the cloudy sky and let out a small sigh, it looks like it will rain again. I thought, as my horse was brought to me, by one of the servants. Making it home two hours later, I managed to beat the rain by mere minutes. Taking my horse to the stable, I took off the saddle and fed him before entering my cozy home. Stepping through the door, I saw Julius sitting in his reclining chair reading a very familiar book. Looking up at seeing me enter, Julius snapped the book closed and looked up at me. Raising my hands I said, I had nothing to do with it. Lifting the book, Adam spoke. Oh you mean the fact that you are in a religious book as the first human? I shrugged. What can I say, I didn't tell them to add me to their religion, they just, did. 
I said with a shrug. But is it possible that you are the first human? Julius asked. I tilted my head. What do you mean? That you are the first human. You said you don't remember anything when you first woke up all those years ago, is it possible you are the first human, Julius? Asked with a serious expression on his face. Oh for fuck's sake. I thought. No I'm not the first human Julius, whoever wrote it probably heard about me, and added me to the book, I don't know if you remember but I was quite the legend back in the day, heck they even put the name everyone gave me back then into the book. I said. You mean the white-haired wanderer? Julius asked. Yes, and plus it said God gave Adam a mark of immortality, have you seen anything on me? I asked Julius. Julius furrowed his brow. No, but it's not like you walk around nude that often. Julius, I don't have any markings on me. I said with a huff. Julius shrugged, then with an evil smirk asked. So how does it feel to be a part of one of the biggest religions in existence? I let out a long sigh as I took off my cloak to hang it by the door. It feels like one massive annoyance, that's what it feels like. It could be worse, people could be praying to you. Julius said with a chuckle. Don't say that, you are going to give me a migraine. Julius let out another chuck clay. Looking around the room I asked Julius. Where is Jane? Julius looked up from the Bible he had reopened to continue reading. She's in the basement, reading your old journals. She can read those? I wrote those in Finnegan, how can she read them? I asked. You did, but you also wrote a translation key, in Latin, which she can read. He said. She has been learning from it, so she can read your older journals. He said, going back to reading the Bible. Shrugging my shoulders, I leaned back in my chair and relaxed into the soft leather. POV slash unknown. Place slash dark cell. In a dark cell, deep under the ground, where no light shone, the sound of someone murmuring couldn't be heard, bouncing off the walls of the cell and echoing down the dark and wet corridors of the underground prison. I will get my revenge, I will make him pay, I will kill him, take away everything that was important to him, Adam will pay said a voice that sounded deranged, over and over again, on a constant repeat. Laying off to the side of the cell was a bowl with small streaks of blood, left behind from the inmates feeding. Not enough to be strong, but just enough to survive. He will pay, he will pay, he will pay. The inmates screamed out, as the madness continued to take their mind from them with every passing second, from the lack of blood, and the pain of loss. I will make him pay, the voice said in a whisper, before finally going silent. Chapter 54, A Plan Year 1200 Well, I'm on the run, or hiding at the moment, I know, who would have thought people from the Middle Ages would be smart enough to put the dots together, that me, a simple man, is the Adam from the Bible. Well it started with people starting to stare at me more and more, which isn't something new, for as long as I can remember since I came to this world, I have been stared at any time I'm in public. With my pale white flawless skin, and silky smooth white hair, I have always been an oddity to people, hell, my height alone sets me apart from the rest of the world. At over six feet tall when everyone else alive is on average five six, I was virtually a giant in their eyes. But as to why I'm on the run, well, people seem to be angered at the fact that I ate from the forbidden tree, and damned humanity to the world they live in. Which is total bullshit. If I was the real Adam, they shouldn't hold me totally responsible, Eve ate from it first. Sure the Adam from the Bible fell to temptation and also ate from the tree, but if only she was banned from the garden, none of them would exist at all, so they should be grateful, to, uh, the fictitious Adam, that isn't me, or well is me, but morphed into a religion to explain the origin of mankind, or maybe I just share the name with the real Adam, and this is all just one big misunderstanding, right? Well anywho. After I got word from my bank head in England that people were starting to get suspicious of me, I decided to take a trip somewhere else for a generation or two, while I wait for those that are suspicious of me to die, so I could return back to England. Something I also learned from this whole thing is I needed to dye my hair for a while, to hide from people a little more than I have been. And hopefully buy myself some time while I come up with a plan of where I'm going to go. To dye my hair I used ground up coal and honey, to dye my hair. I would like to say it was a massive success and it worked perfectly. And well, it did, sort of. The coal turned my hair a medium grey colour and not the black I was going for, but it was acceptable. Now, not completely sticking out like a sore thumb, I had to figure out what I'm going to do for the next 80 gruelling years. 
I asked Jane and Julius if they wanted to come with me, but they said they were travelled out. How preposterous of them, I did it way longer than them, and I never got bored of it, although that might have something to do with my emotional dampeners, which dampen any feelings I might have, which would drive me nuts, like boredom, or complete sadness. Eh, who cares, it's been a while since I did something on my own anyway. I thought. So now I just need to decide what I'm to do. At the moment, I'm sitting on a wooden box, in a dock in London, looking around the busy port. I watched as people came and went, kids, women, and men. All going about their daily travels, as I sat watching, and slowly kicked my feet back and forth on the box. Thankfully they don't stare at me so much anymore with my new hair color. I thought with a rueful smile. Looking up at the squawk of a bird, I started to think again. What is happening in the world right now? I wondered. Better question, what isn't happening right now? You have Ken about to start his reign of conquest, the Fourth Crusade is about to happen, and most of the world is in a state of flourishment. I continued to think while I sat, hunched on the wooden box. Hmm, I haven't given being a soldier a try yet, and it would be cool to ride with the Great Gone in his conquest, so why don't I do both I thought as a smile slowly grew on my face. First I would try soldiering in the Crusades first, since this round of it will start in 1202, and Genghis Khan will start his main advancement somewhere around 1209, so that will give me a few years to toddle around as a soldier, then I can ride with the Mongol hordes. Making my way to my bank in London I slowly wandered to muddy streets filled with common folk. At the moment London boasted a population of around 30,000 people. Not massive like some places like Rome, Hangzhou, Constantinople and definitely not Baghdad, which had around 1 million people in that one city alone. But it was a respectable amount. Walking down the streets, I looked around at the homes that went up to three stories high. I always loved seeing those homes, they always reminded me of Diagon Alley from Harry Potter, with their crooked and leaning look to them, as well as the fact they were built to overhang the streets below, making them all the more dangerous and cool looking. Finally making my way to the bank, I stopped and stared at the opulent stone building. The bank was mostly made out of stone, with a clay roofing, which should protect it from any fire that will go up in this city in the next couple of years. The bank wasn't as pretty as some of my other banks in larger cities like Rome and Alexandria, but it did have its charms. The bank was about 90,000 square feet, and had five steps that led up to the large steel doors of the bank, which was guarded by eight heavily armed and armored men, and that's just by the door. I knew that on the inside were almost 50 other soldiers patrolling the bank's ground floor, while in the underground vaults there was a constant rotation of another 30 soldiers. The inside was lit by torches and candles, since there were no windows built into the structure, the main metal doors the only opening for air to enter. But the only reason the people on the inside could breathe was because I had them place metal tubes high up off the ground towards the root, which allowed air to come in. I also had them do the same for the underground area all because people in this time period couldn't figure out, that there is no air underground. Entering the bank with my gold card in hand, I was shown to the current bank head. His name was Abel Grew, and was a short, thin man that was currently in the final stages of hair loss. Stepping into his small office, Abel practically fell over himself to accommodate me, asking if I would like a drink, or anything under the sun. No thank you Abel, I just popped by to ask you to do some small things for me. I said to him. Oh of course, what w would you like for me to do for you sir? I need you to get me a set of chain mail, a helmet, a horse and a couple of people to carry all of my gear and to polish all of it. I said in one breath. Abel was wide-eyed at my words, as if I was God talking to a mere cow. But hey, I guess since he nodded his head, he got the message. Not wanting to stand here for the rest of the day while the man stared at me, I gave him a small smile and a wave, then headed out. Now. I should have specified the limits of what I asked for. A set of chain mail, which is one set of mail like a shirt. A helmet, which is one helmet. A horse, is a fucking horse. And people to carry and take care of all my gear, should have been maybe one or two people. Not the small freaking army I found a few days later waiting for my arrival. And I mean, no less than 100 people. Oh you have got to be kidding me I thought as I looked at the mass of people. There were about 40 soldiers in full gear, and about 60 servants that would follow behind us with carts full of supplies. Mentally smacking myself for being slow to the fact that my bank had see me as a god, and anything I say is gospel, and to not follow my words is sacrilege, and in this point in time, sacrilege is a big no-no. So, 
facing the music I slowly made my way through the crowd of people and into the bank, while trying to stay invisible. Sitting behind his desk was my good friend Abel, acting as if he did nothing wrong. Closing the door to his office, I turned to look at Abel with a raised eyebrow. Ah, sir you arrived. He said in a cheerful voice. Yes, I did. I said in a dry tone. Not seeming to hear my tone, Abel continued. Well sir, if you would follow me, I will show you to Captain Travis he will dot. I raised a hand to cut him off. Abel, the other day I meant only a few people to follow me, not a small village. He looked at me confused. But sir, you asked for people to carry all of your supplies. I nodded my head. Yes, one or two people, not one hundred people. Abel raised his hands. I am sorry sir, I thought this is what you wanted. He said. I let out a sigh. Have they already been paid? I asked. He shook his head. Only half of what they would be getting, the rest they would be paid when all of you returned. He said. Right, like any of them would be alive by the time I returned, I thought. Look, since they won't be leaving with me, just tell them they can keep what they have been paid, and to go home and look for other work, just pick two people to carry and take care of my gear would you? I told him. He slowly nodded his head. Very well sir, I will do as you ask. He said, and bustled out of the room. Chapter 56, In the Dog House, and Wolves POV Julius Sitting in his reclining chair, Julius read a rather interesting passage from one of Adam's journals. It was a passage about his journey east, along the Silk Road, and how he started to learn the Asian language on the road. As he was reading, Jane came from their room, also holding one of Adam's old and battered journals. Stopping in front of the fire, Jane turned to look at Julius. Do you think he actually did everything he's written about, and seen all those wonderful things? She asked him. Julius lowered what he was reading and looked at her. I do, you should know Adam isn't one for embellishment, and if anything, he understated most of his writings. Jane raised one of her perfect eyebrows. Really? She asked. Julius nodded his head. In fact, recently, I found out Adam has been hiding a few things from us. He said and shook his head. Jane slowly lowered the journal she had been holding. Like what? She asked him. Julius nod on his lip for a moment, while deciding if it was a good idea to tell her. Do you know why Adam decided to leave for a little while? Julius asked her. Something about joining some holy army or something. Jane said with a shrug. He had three other opportunities to do that, but now, out of nowhere, he just decides to leave. Julius guided her to a conclusion. Maybe he just became curious. She said questioningly. Julius let out a sigh. He loved Jane with every inch of his heart, but Jane seemed to always be oblivious to things that should be right in front of her. Jane is smart, that there is no doubt, but she seems to look at the smaller picture, rather than the forest through the trees, but Julius was working on that with her. Have you read the Bible? Julius asked her. Jane gave another shrug. A little. Did you get to the part about the Garden of Eden? He asked. She nodded her head. And what were the names of the first humans? He again guided her. Instantly Jane said. It was Eve and Ad. Jane came to a halt. The journal she had been holding slipped from her hands to flop onto the stone ground. Adam. She finished, wide-eyed, and open-mouthed. Julius nodded his head. That's right, our Adam might be the first man, created by God. He said. Jane, still in a state of shock, said. But, but, but. Julius raised his hands. I asked him about it, but he refused to confirm the fact, he said he wasn't the first human, but I have read and reread the Bible over and over, and the description of Adam from the Bible, matches our Adam perfectly, making it hard for me to believe that he isn't the first human, Julius said. Continuing before Jane could speak, Julius said. But Adam did have a good rebuke. He said, a long time ago he was a well-known traveler, that became something of a myth, called the white-haired traveler and went from village to village all over the world, helping the sick, as well as being a traitor, his journals can confirm that, so it is possible that his legend just got mixed into the Bible, Julius said. I suppose, but Adam also doesn't remember anything from before he woke in that forest, so it is possible, Jane said. Yes that is true, but our Adam also doesn't have any marks on him which the Adam from the Bible is said to have. 
Jane slowly nodded her head. I suppose. After a moment of silence, Jane's eyebrows furrowed. And how long exactly have you known about this? She asked Julius. Julius scratched the side of his head, not because of an itch, but out of habit. Well, about, um, about three hundred years. He said. Three hundred years. Jane shouted. Julius raised his hands as if to protect himself from Jane's oncoming vocal attack. You didn't say anything for three hundred years. She said angrily. Well, it didn't seem so important, so what if Adam is or isn't the first human? It isn't important Julius, what is important, is that you said nothing, for nearly three hundred years. Julius slowly lowered his hands and looked at Jane. I'm confused. He said. Well you shouldn't be, we are going to be together for possibly the rest of eternity Julius, we need to be open with each other, Jane said sternly. But Julius managed to get out, before Jane stopped him with a raised hand. No buts Julius, uh huh, you men, she said, before picking up the dropped journal, and storming off, while Julius sat in his chair, confused. Is this what Adam meant, when he said women think differently than men he wondered as he sat there. What really confused Julius, was that she was angry about that, and didn't even seem to care about the fact Adam could possibly be the first human to live, but instead that he didn't say anything to her about it. I should have gone with Adam Julius thought. Looking into the roaring fire, in the fireplace, Julius spoke aloud. I wonder what he is doing at the moment. Adam POV. No, the other way, I said, as I showed John how to polish my helmet. At the moment we were about two days from Paris, where we would be massing for the crusade. Sitting around a small fire were myself, John, and Henry. The two of them reminded me of Murdig and Mulroy from Pirates of the Caribbean, if I wasn't in a separate universe altogether, I would have thought they were them. John looked just like the heavyset Mulroy, while Henry looked just like the skinny Murdoch. And even more, they acted just like them. Yeah you dimwit, the other way. Murdoch, or Henry said to John, as he sharpened the prop sword I had bought. Turning to look at Henry the first said. Quiet you, and start sharpening that blade correctly, instead of just moving the whetstone along the blade, how about you focus on your own task? I said to him. Now, normally, I am slow to get annoyed, but these two have been bickering non-stop since they were assigned to me. The only reason I accepted them was because they looked like two of the characters from some of my favorite movies, which caused me to, at the time, overlook their annoying tendencies. Sitting back down on a log, I moved my feet towards the fire, and let out a long sigh. I'm already tired of this journey. I thought. It had been a very long time since I had been to Northern Europe, like France, Germany and all those countries, and instead focused on places like Rome, the Middle East, and Asia, instead. Not out of a hate for these places, but that there was nothing here for me. As we sat, in silence, with only the pops and crackling of the fire for noise, as well as the sounds of Henry and John finishing their tasks, I was finally able to let out a relaxed sign, as the warmth of the fire washed over me. Crack. My eyes popped open at the sound of a large branch being broken, from somewhere around us. Both John and Henry came to a complete halt, as they too heard the sound. Turning to look in the direction of the sound, I looked into the inky blackness of the surrounding forest. With my eyes, I could see into the forest much better than any normal human could, but not as great as a vampire could. Vampires could see in total blackness, while I needed at least a little light to see, but unfortunately, the night sky was covering the full moon's light with thick clouds, and the fire we sat by, only made it harder for me to see out, and into the darkness. Turning to look at John and Henry, I said. Henry, give me my sword, I am going to check out what that sound was. I said, as I put my hand out for my prop sword. I bought the prop sword for its simplicity. I didn't need a master made blade now that I could use my aura ability to make even a dull blade sharper than anything on this planet, and besides I was going up against humans this time not vampires. I also didn't bring my own sword this time, because of its uniqueness, which would draw some unwanted looks that I didn't need at the moment. Henry quickly handed over my long sword, while nervously looking around the dark woods. Why yes sir, here you are. He said while handing it over. As he was handing it over, my ears started to pick up the sound of leaves being stepped on as well as some sticks being stepped on, and alarmingly I could hear all of that, in all directions. We are surrounded. I thought. It must be bandits. But before I could do anything, 
a gust of wind blew through the camp, bringing a very distinct smell with it. As the smell registered in my brain, a sound traveled from no less than 100 feet from our camp piercing my ears. Howl! I turned in the direction of the howl, and readied my blade, waiting to activate my aura. This can't be right, that was way too loud for a wolf. I thought. Turning my head to look at John and Henry who were now sitting close to each other by the fire, I spoke. The both of you stay here, and don't do anything stupid. I said, before stepping into the dark forest. Chapter 57, Werewolves or Demons Stepping into the woods, I was finally able to see into the forest, with the bright light of the fire to my back, it gave me enough light to see deep into the thick woods. Hearing the sound of rustling undergrowth, I turned to see what was making the noise, and hoping it wasn't what I thought it was. Moving in a blurry streak, a brown-colored creature came straight for me. Not thinking of my actions, I activated my aura ability, and sliced down on the creature as soon as it was close enough for the attack. My new longsword, which was nearly a foot longer than my own gladius sword, gave me the advantage of distancing myself from any attacker, as well as giving me a greater attack range without the need to move, and if this creature is what I think it is, the last thing I needed was to be bitten, or possibly scratched. Yes my system purged most of the vampiric venom from my body, but it still left a trait behind, who knows what would happen if a werewolf was to do the same to me, and what trait could be left in me. But with my speed and strength, I should be able to hold off any number that was here. My sword sliced the beast in half, straight down the middle, splitting the beast in two. As the two halves of the beast separated, the momentum of its movement brought the two halves past me, where they hit the ground to my sides. Looking down at one of the halves to my right, I looked down at the creature I had just killed, and when I saw what it was, my stomach dropped. The beast was a mix between human, and wolf, with a barrel chest, and fur covering around 80% of it. Werewolf, I thought. The arms and legs looked to be stretched out and bent in inhumane ways, while its hands were elongated and starched out to claw-tipped fingers. Using my foot, I rolled the core over to get a look at one half of the face. As I did so, guts, and bones, sludged out of it, to steam on the ground. Ignoring the disgusting insides, I looked the creature over. The face weirded me out to no end. It had a human-like eye that was wide open, and looked to be a mix of light blue and a dark yellowish green, with an elongated mouth that lengthened and turned into that of a wolf, which seemed strange mixed with a human-like cheekbone structure. The face had patches of brown fur and pointed ears that had no hair, and looked like they belonged to a goblin. Fuck was all my brain managed to get out as I saw for the first time, something I didn't know existed. The movies never said anything about this, just shapeshifters in the Americas, not werewolves. I mumbled to myself as my eyebrows narrowed with concern. I did remember a few times in the movies, the vulturey mentioning werewolves, instead of shapeshifters, which the pack in the movie are, for so long I had yet to see any until now, so I had assumed that only the Quillute tribe existed, and were the only kind of supernatural beasts besides the vampires. The difference between werewolves and shapeshifters is that shapeshifters are born, while werewolves are created, sort of like vampires are created, both vampires and werewolves are created by a venom or virus that gets into their bloodstream, and changing them at a genetic level. What can make them so dangerous is that werewolves turn into mindless animals that will kill anything breathing they can find during full moons, and can't turn at will. While shapeshifters are fully in control of themselves, while in their beast forms. Turning my head, I could hear what sounded to me like a herd of animals heading straight for me. Bracing myself for what was more than likely the rest of the pack, I couldn't help, but let out a mental sigh, as the problems all of this would bring, ran through my head. Now I have to deal with this. I was really looking forward to joining a crusade. Oh well, isn't there going to be more, or perhaps I can eradicate all of the werewolves before it even starts. I thought, as the first werewolf, came into my sight. The last thing this world needs, is for this to spread uncontrollably around the world. John slash Henry POV Both John and Henry, sat glued to their seated spots, as they watched the brilliant light show that was taking place in front of them. Bright purple light streamed through the thick forest, as the sounds of what they could only describe as a pack of wolves fighting and yelping. The noise echoed through the forest and into their camp, leaving both of them scared to their bones. What in heaven is that? John said, in fear and astonishment. It must be the work of the devil. Henry stammered out, as his chest heaved in panic. No, it must be some sort of light, Sir Adam is using to see. John said, as he watched the light. Henry looked over at him. 
he must be one of those witches, or a soldier of the devil. Henry said, with the fever of a true believer. We have been travelling with Sir Adam for a few weeks now, and I'm no slow-minded farmer, I have been to church every holy day, and I haven't seen any signs of him being either a witch or an agent of evil, because I for one, haven't seen him eat a single baby, or devour a soul John shot back at Henry. Henry let out a gasp. He must have set a spell on you. He said, scooting away from John. But Henry only managed to scoot a little over a foot from John, when something came crashing through the forest and into the middle of their camp. The sound brought them both to a halt, as the core of a strange beast crashed down right where Henry had been seated. Both John and Henry sat in shock, as they got a good look at what had just landed between them. MMM monster. John said in a panic, as he used his hands to crawl back and away from the beast. While Henry himself did the same, while shouting. It's the spawn of the devil, it's the spawn of the devil. John had backed up to the log Adam had been using before the monster attack, while Henry, backed into the cart's wheel. I told you this was a bad idea. Henry shouted, pointing an accusing finger at John. Me, you can't do that, you agreed to come, even after I warned you, that there would be danger on a crusade. John shot back. True, but I was expecting a human enemy, not this. He shouted, gesturing at the core. All the while they argued, the battle continued in the surrounding forest. And the cart horse stood not far away, munching on some dry grass calmly, and without a care in the world. Adam POV. My sword took off limbs, and sliced through the small horde of werewolves that continued to attack me. Even after five minutes of continued slicing and chopping, the werewolves seemed to be unfazed at the destruction I was causing them, and the pile of their bodies I was leaving around me, continued to grow. Like crazed beasts, they continued to attack me, but like the rest of their friends, they only got within the range of my sword, before they were killed, with a blow of my blade. What surprised me was the strength and speed these werewolves possessed. If I had to say, they could be on part with the average vampire that is out of their newborn phase. They had the speed to be a blurry motion while running, and from the speed, and sound their clawed hands made, when I dodged them, I could tell there was some serious strength behind their hits. Blocking a particularly feral swing, I chopped off the limb, and then the head of the beast. Just like the battle with the vampires I lost myself in the fight. I didn't want to use my shockwave at the moment, because there wasn't much of a need. At the moment, I was cutting them down with almost complete ease, and didn't find the use of it necessary, and just a waste. In a blur I continued to slice and chop the werewolves into pieces, like a blender. After a few more minutes, the once steady stream of wolves slowed down a bit, until no more were adding to the fight, and I was able to finish off the last remaining werewolves. Breathing a little harder than normal from my exertions, I looked around, and was a bit amazed. In sliced pieces and decapitated corpses, the bodies of no less than 300 werewolves, scattered the woods. A few of the trees had large chunks of bark and wood missing, from when I threw a wolf or two, into them, and the ground was soggy from the large amounts of blood that I had just spilt. Just then the clouds began to clear a bit, and let a stream of the moon's light to stream down, and light the forest with its glow. What the fuck? I let out with a sigh. I need to figure out where this is coming from I thought as I looked down at the wolf I had stepped on. Underscore. Author's Notes. So the MC will still become a crusader, but first he will need to track down where the werewolves are coming from, and who, or what, is turning people. Unfortunately he won't become a Mongol though. Something is going to pop up, that will keep him away from doing that, and keep him from destroying the Mongols, for some of the things they had done. By the time he becomes a crusader, it will be when they are leaving on ships to sack Constantinople. I have a good idea for the sacking of Constantinople, where the MC will do something to spread his legend, and maybe a little extra. Werewolves will be eradicated, partly by the MC and the other part by the Vulturi. I will do a chapter in the Vulturi's POV about their run-ins with werewolves, which will start their hate for them, and by connection, the shapeshifters, that will be in forks. Interestingly, the moon-touched werewolves are as fast, and slightly stronger than a regular vampire, but not on the same level as a newborn, even so, they are still a real threat to the vampire and human worlds. They are also smaller than a shapeshifter's wolf form, who are on average twice the size of werewolves, but can still hold their own, against either shapeshifters or vampires. This should show how much stronger the MC is compared to the rest of the vampiric and supernatural world. But don't worry, I know he is super OP, but I already have an endgame enemy 
who will be on par with the MC, and something, or more like someone, I think will surprise all of you. Chapter 58, Attempted Explanation in a Battle of Wit I broke from my thoughts, as the sounds of panicked voices came from behind me, where I had forgotten about my two very human, and completely normal companions, who were still in the camp. Fuuk I thought, as I remembered their presence. Slowly making my way back to the camp, I started to think of things to say to them, that might explain to them what just happened. Stepping into the small opening, and into the camp's fire light, my presence became known to both John and Henry at the same time. Both of them were in the middle of a rather loud argument, when my blood-covered figure emerged from the dark forest surrounding them. Henry and John both turned to face me and promptly lost their minds. Ah! Henry screamed as he backed away from me, but ended up bumping into the also screaming John, who was standing behind him, causing them to fall to the ground. Don't eat our souls! John cried out, as he covered his face and head with his arms, while Henry used both of his pointer fingers to make a cross, as he prayed loudly. The cacophony of noise they made, made me wince at their raised, and panicked voices. Looking to the side of the camp, I saw the cart horse munching away at some dry grass. Getting tired of the noise coming from the two, I shouted. Will the both of you shut your air holes? Both of them went dead silent, as they looked at me. I raised my hand, to stop Henry from speaking. SHHHHH, not a word. I said. Shutting his mouth again, I waited to see if either would try and speak again. When neither did, I let out a sigh. At least let me clean up, before the both of you start asking questions. I said, walking past them, and to my previously seated spot. Stepping over the dead body of a werewolf, I sat back down on my log, and started taking off my tunic and other bloody clothes. It took me about ten minutes before I was charged and cleaned up, using water from our water skins to clean myself. Now, seated by the fire in some clean clothes, I looked over the fire where both John, and Henry had seated themselves, right next to each other, neither of them looking away from me. Raising my hands I said. Ask away. While I had been changing into some new clothes I had decided to just tell them part of the truth, because my brain was completely blank, when I tried to think up an excuse for what had happened, and figured, if they were to tell others, they wouldn't be believed. Are you a soldier of the devil? Henry asked first. I shook my head. No, I'm not. I said. Are you a witch? John asked. No, and the male term is wizard. Witches are female, while wizards are male. I said. They both let out gasps. Only a witch would know that. Henry said, with fear. I looked at him. I am not a witch, I am human, just like you. I said. Liar, you be a demon from the fires of hell, sent to destroy us, and eat all of our souls. Henry said. I smacked my forehead, and let out a sigh. Look, the both of you dimwits, I am not a demon, I am a human, with, abilities. What did you just call us? John said, angered. You heard my words, and if you two don't, oh, what's the point, the both of you don't even have a single brain cell between the both of you to make a sandwich. I said, in irritation. Is that a slur, John said as he stood to his feet, with Henry hot on his heels to follow his lead. Because I'll let you know, I've been in a few dust-ups in my time, and I haven't lost a one, but if you slur our mums again, we can have a go. John said, raising his fists, ready to fight. Yeah, don't slur our mums Henry added, at John's side, also raising his fists for a fight. I couldn't help but let out a raucous laugh. The two of them looked like children getting ready for a schoolyard brawl. Both of them had their thumbs in their palms, with the rest of their fingers covering them to make fists, and the clear fear in their eyes only made it funnier. Either these two really don't have a brain cell between them, or they have bigger gonads than brains. I thought, as I brought my laughter under control. I, don't laugh, your life be on the end of a tether here and now. Henry said, as he moved his fist in a circle. Again I let out a laugh, but while I wiped a tear from the corner of my eye, I slowly stood up and looked at them. I meant no disrespect. I told them. Both John and Henry looked at each other, then back at me. Really? Henry said in confusion. I nodded my head. Really? At my words, they slowly lowered their hands. Good John said, with a sniff, while he crossed his arms over his chest. I let a small smile spread across my face, at his words. Now, 
let me put this in a way both of you can understand, mayhaps God fashioned thee both with the wit of turnips and the visages of mangy curs. Both John and Henry looked to be shell-shocked. What? John shouted, with anger, as he rolled up his sleeves, ready for a fight. Wait, John. Henry said, grabbing a hold of John's arm. Once John had stopped, Henry turned to look at me, then taking a wired pose, with one leg bent, and one hand under his chin, he said. Thy mind is as dull as a worn-out plow, unable to cultivate a single intelligent thought, but thou, be, be, uh -huh. Again I couldn't hold back my laughter at Henry's failed attempt. You flee, you forgot how it went. John whispered into Henry's ear. Turning to face John, Henry whispered back. I couldn't help it, it was too long to remember. John grabbed Henry by his tunic's collar, and said. But we've been practicing for nearly a full moon, how could you forget? He angrily asked Henry. Like I said, it's too long to remember, and if you wish to belittle me, the least you can do is tell me how it's supposed to go. Henry shot back. It's supposed to go, uh, it's supposed to go like. John said, as he looked up in thought. Henry pointed his finger at John. You have also forgotten. He said angrily at John. Have not he said back. Have to. Have not. Have to. Have not John said, this time pushing Henry back a step. Have to. Henry said, pushing John back twice as hard. You little, rotten little. John stammered, as he rushed Henry, tackling him to the ground. All throughout their whispered argument, to their shoving match, and now fight. I had been listening, and laughing like a madman at them, off to the side. Watching them roll around on the ground, I couldn't help but fall over laughing. The two of them were just like little kids. The way they argued, all the way to how they fought each other, I couldn't help but laugh at them. After a minute of rolling on the ground, I finally managed, with a great amount of willpower, to get my laughter under control. Sitting up, I wiped the streams of tears away with the sleeves of my tunic, before standing up again. By this point, both John and Henry weren't even fighting anymore, but were instead, just laying on the ground, breathing hard, and throwing insults at each other. All right, all right, that's enough, we have gone way beyond topic. I said, as I sat back on the fallen log. Slowly, and with a bit of difficulty, John and Henry, sat up, and made their way back to the fire, where they both plopped back down, both of them still breathing hard. Right, where were we? I asked myself. Which is? John said, as he pulled some grass from his hair. Right, I said, snapping my fingers. Like I had been saying before, I am not a witch nor a wizard, I am human, with a few abilities. Neither John, nor Henry, said anything, and instead stayed silent at my words, both too exhausted from their three-minute brawl. Very good, any questions? I asked. What abilities do you have? Henry asked. Good question, well, I'm stronger and faster than ten men. I said proudly. Both John and Henry looked at me with unbelieving eyes. Sure. I shrugged my shoulders and stood. Going to the cart, I picked up from the back, an axe with a metal top. Going back to my seat, I handed it to them. Is the axe head metal? I asked. Both of them looked at it and then tested the axe, making sure it was real. After a few moments, they handed it back. It's real. Henry said. Good I said simply, before grabbing the top with both hands, and twisted. The axe head turned, as if it was rubber in my grip, before it broke in two. Both John and Henry stared wide-eyed and open-mouthed at what I had just done. My goodness. John said in amazement. After a moment of silence, John asked. If you are a regular man like us, then how did you get your abilities? He asked with a raised eyebrow. This is where I was going to use their faith against them. With a wide smile, I said. God. Both of their eyes went wide. God. Both John and Henry wide-eyed said in unison. I nodded my head. That's right. I said with a smile. Henry leaned over to John and whispered into his ear. Don't listen to him, it's all lies he must be a demon from hell sent to test our faith. As long as we stay true, God will protect us. He said, nodding his head. I couldn't help but smack my forehead again. This is going to be a long night. I thought, before speaking again. And just decided to use the biggest card I had. 
I am the Atom Card. Chapter 59, A Quick Lesson Then Reveal OK look, I have some questions to ask I said. John, you said you went to church every holy day, correct? I asked him. He nodded his head. We both did. He said, pointing his thumb at himself then Henry. Good, I said standing up. So, the both of you know a good bit of the Bible? I asked. Both of them nodded. And so the both of you know how mankind came to be on earth? I asked. Yes, we do. Henry said. Then you know of Genesis? I asked. The creation of earth, heaven, hell, Adam, and Eve. I continued. Of course we do, just like any God-fearing man on his earth should. Henry said, while straightening his back proudly. I nodded my head, and bent down to grab a burning piece of wood from the edge of the fire. And what does Genesis tell you about Adam and Eve? I asked, while waving the piece of wood through the air, and allowing some embers to fly off into the air. Well, it says Adam was created from the dust of earth, to be in the image of God, then have life breathed into him. John said, leaning back on his hands. Correct. I said pointing the still burning stick at John. Turning it to point at Henry the first asked. And what of Eve? She was created from one of Adam's ribs, when God saw that Adam needed a companion. Very good. I said, putting the stick partially back into the fire. The reason I was asking them all of these questions was because if I was to just come out and say, yeah you know that guy you currently think helped doom you to your miserable life here on earth, when you could be in Eden without any fears, yup, that's me, Adam, the Adam. They either wouldn't believe a word I said, or would hate me, and run away, which wouldn't be the worst thing that could happen, but what can I say, I've become attached to the two morons. They just had this way of being annoyingly funny. But my plan now is to paint my alter ego Adam in a better light, and correct them in their thinking. Because just like back in London, they believed Adam and Eve are the sole reason for being kicked from Eden, and the serpent that convinced them takes the back seat in their thoughts, to be forgotten, even though it is the serpent which caused all of it. Thankfully I only need to convince two people and not a city. And why did Adam and Eve get banished from Eden? I asked. Oh I know this one. John said excitedly. They ate from the tree of knowledge, disobeying God's command, and condemning man. I nodded my head. So, do you blame them for doing so? I asked. Of course we do. Henry said, in an angry voice. Oh really, and why did they eat from the tree when they clearly knew not to? I asked them. Both of them went silent, clearly thinking hard. I waited for a moment, but they were clearly having trouble. I let out a small sight. The serpent. I said. Eh, that's right. Henry said, wagging a finger in the air. And what did the serpent do? I asked them. It told Eve to eat from the tree. John said, in a self-assured manner. And I said, waving my hand for him to continue. And what? He asked. Oh, so you think the serpent just said, Hey, do you see that tree over there, the one God said not to eat from, you should go and eat from it, and Eve just said, Okay. And? Went to eat from the tree. I asked them. Both of them stared at me. Well, yet. Henry said with furrowed brows. I shook my head at his words. Who was the serpent? I asked. The devil. John asked, in a questioning tone. That's correct. I said. The master of all that is evil, deceptive, deceitful, a liar. Do you think he told the truth when he told Eve to eat from the tree of knowledge? I asked. No both John and Henry said in unison. That's right, no, he didn't, the serpent who is the devil, engaged Eve in a conversation, questioning and distorting God's command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The serpent deceived Eve into believing that eating from the tree would not lead to death but would make her like God, knowing good and evil. I said. Both John and Henry took on contemplative looks, as they thought on my words. So it's not Eve's or Adam's fault for eating from the tree John said, while rubbing his scruffy chin. Correct, they were misled into believing it wasn't bad for them to do so. I said. They nodded their heads. Why do you bring all of this up? Henry asked, confused. I raised my hand. I'm getting to that. I said. Leaning back down, I grabbed the stick I had placed back into the fire, and took it out. Now, what happened once Adam and Eve were banished from Eden? I asked. 
Well, Adam worked the land while Eve had to bear children. John said. Correct, then what? I asked, really starting to get into my teacher mode. Well, Adam worked the land, while Eve had two sons. Henry said. Would you look at that, the two of you are smarter than I was giving you credit for. I said jokingly. Before either could get angry, I continued. And what happened to the two sons, Cain and Abel? I asked. They worked the land with their father Adam. John said. Yes, but what happened to them? I asked. Oh, Cain killed his brother in a fit of jealousy, becoming the first to kill another human. Henry said. That's right. I said. But Adam, their father saw this happen, and in a rage, killed Cain, becoming the second to do so. Henry added. And who also saw this happen? God, he saw it happen. John said. And what did he do to Adam? He cursed Adam with immortality and to be a wanderer. Henry said. Do you think Adam deserved it? I asked them. Both of them took on looks of thought. I don't John said. A few moments later, so did Henry. Neither do I he said. A small smile appeared on my face. And why is that? I asked. Well, if I had been in his place, I might have done the same. Henry said. I as well. John added. Very good. So they don't mind what Adam did to his other son. It was the whole eating from the tree of knowledge, and being banished from Eden that held them back from accepting that neither Adam or Eve are bad. I thought, as the small smile on my smile slowly grew. Waving the burning stick around again, my eyes followed the small flames that burned the top half of the stick. What do the two of you think he is doing now? I asked. Just what God cursed him to do, wander. John said with a shrug. I let out a chuckle. Yes, I think so too, never able to stay in one place for long before becoming unsatisfied, and bored, before a need to wander starts to take hold, and a need to move takes over. I said. Looking down at John and Henry, I saw that they were both looking at me confused. That's why I brought all of this up. I said. Both John and Henry looked at each other. UMM, I'm lost. John said, raising an eyebrow. The reason I brought all of that up is because well. I said, breaking off. Here goes nothing I thought. I am the Adam from the Bible. I said, dropping the stick to the ground and reaching my whole hand back into the fire and grabbing one of the logs that was bright red. The flames burned into my flesh, and made a steaming sizzling sound as my flesh was burned when I grabbed onto the large log. The pain was intense and hurt like hell, but was gone as soon as it came, my flesh healing faster than I was being burned, and instead of pure pain, it only felt like the prickly feeling you get when a limb has fallen asleep. Looking at both John and Henry the first saw they watched my actions with bewildered and shocked looks. Waiting a moment to let what I had just done sink into their minds, I removed my hand from the red, burning, fire, and raised the log in my hand up for both of them to see. Chapter 60, Question so this is out of my own curiosity, as well as a need for your input for my next fanfic. Currently I'm still writing this fanfiction full time, and won't fully start another FIC until this one is done. But I would like to ask what you would like as my next fanfiction. Asking now, will give me time to look into, and plan, what the next story will be about. Here is a small list of some of the ones I strongly suggest as a choice. I won't write anime, I couldn't give those shows the writing they deserve and I'm 99.9% .9 sure I couldn't do it properly. So I will stick to shows or video games. Asterisk Red Dead Redemption 2 through 1. Asterisk Lucifer, Netflix show. Asterisk Ragnarok, Netflix show, slash really hoping this one so I could give it a ending it truly deserves backslash. Asterisk Assassin's Creed, Unknown Witch. Asterisk Hunger Games, Movie, 1 through 4. Asterisk The Good Doctor. Show. Asterisk Peaky Blinders, show. Asterisk The Sopranos, show. Asterisk Kingsman. Asterisk Mafia, game unknown which. Asterisk Sherlock, movie of show your choice. Asterisk The Ridiculous Six, movie. Asterisk The Dirt, movie slash heavy music. Asterisk Sex Ed, Netflix show. Asterisk Star Wars, The Force Awakens slash already have an idea for this one. Asterisk Harry Potter. Movies. We'll add more at a later time. Other. I would like to do one that has been done before on this site, instead on the same thing reused over and over again, 
because after a while they all seem to be the same. If you have any ideas share with me and I will add it to the list if it resonates with me. I 100% will finish the Twilight FIC and won't rush it, this is just to give a good heads up for what I might write next. Bean. Chapter 61, The Village. Currently, I was making my way through the forest on my own, following the clear tracks that the werewolf pack had left behind them. The tracks were clear to just about anyone who would see them, be they experienced trackers like myself, or any blundering fool who came across them. With foliage and small trees trampled, it gave the perfect direction to head in. As I followed the tracks at a steady pace, I couldn't help but think back to last night when I told both John and Henry that I was the Adam from the Bible. And just like them to do, they didn't fully believe a word that came out of my mouth, no matter what I said, or, more like, John believes me, while Henry is stuck, and thinks that I am using black magic. I knew no matter what I said, he wouldn't believe me, and would just believe I was a witch, so I gave up. Because at least John believed me, and one is better than none. Breaking from my thoughts, I came out of the forest and into a large clearing that had a small village in the middle of it. The village was ramshackle and made from wood, so in other words, just like every other poor village to exist. But what confused me was how quiet it looked. There wasn't a soul in sight, or smoke rising from the village, which is something you would always see in a village, always there would be at least one stream rising above a village, but here, there was nothing. Slowly making my way towards the village, I opened up all of my scenes for any sign of inhabitants or anything that could tell me what was going on. I knew since the tracks led straight here, that the werewolves I had killed probably all came from this village, or through it. I didn't know if anyone was still here, who could hopefully tell me what had happened. Making my way to the main thoroughfare of the village, I could see a few mutilated bodies scattered about. The bodies looked to have been ripped apart, and eaten in a few places. Not stopping to investigate them, I continued to walk down the middle of the village, listening. As I walked, I stepped over the corpses of animals, and humans alike, all of them ripped to shreds. While I did so, I looked at the shacks and buildings that were on the sides of the main road. Most of them, if not all, looked to have been nearly destroyed, with large holes in their wall or doors. As I got to the far end of the village, I came to the village's church. Just like most villages with one, the church was the biggest and nicest building, in the whole village, made of stone, and taken care of, the church stood out, as the biggest building, it also had a large wooden door in the front. At the moment, the large door was open, and creaking loudly in the wind. Not hearing anything, I slowly stepped in, then had to hold a hand over my nose. Shit! Was all I managed to get out as I looked over the massacre in front of me. In front of me, was a scene from a horror movie. Limbs and gore covered the entirety of the inside of the church as if everyone was put in a blender. Turning to leave before I got sick from the smell, I heard a soft, bump from the side of the church. In a blur, I had my sword removed, and at the ready, with a purple glow lining the blade, facing the noise. Looking over to where I heard the noise, I could see a small wooden cupboard, which was covered with the body of a rather large man, who had his insides torn from his body. Looking around once more and not seeing anything, I slowly made my way to the cupboard, while still keeping my sword ready, for a possible attack. Stepping close to the dead man's body, I pushed him to the side, his stiff body easily rolled away from the cupboard's small doors. Taking a small step back, I waited for something to happen. But nothing did. Narrowing my brow, I spoke in the local dialect. Come out now. I waited a moment, but again nothing happened. Looking at the cupboard, I realized how small it really was. It could only hold maybe one grown person inside, so there was no need for me to be so paranoid and whoever was in there was probably scared to death. Slowly lowering my sword. I tried one more time before opening the doors myself. I am friendly, I am not here to hurt you, I said, in a softer tone. But again nothing happened. Was I just hearing things? I thought. It might have just been a noise from the man's dead body. I thought, sheathing my sword, and looking at the stiffened corpse of the unbold man. Wanting to be careful anyhow. I stepped closer to the cupboard and bent down to open one of the doors. But before my hand could touch one of the knobs to open it, one of them slowly cracked open. Going dead still, I stared at the small door as it slowly opened. Taking a step back, I watched the small door open to reveal a small figure inside, but then the other door opened up, and another even smaller figure was revealed. Kids. I slowly put my hands up, as I saw them, and they saw me. Hello, 
I said softly. From the look of it, they were two boys, between the ages of three and four years old. Both of them were curled up with their knees to their chests. And the fear in their eyes hurt to see. It's okay, you can come out, I am a friend, I said to them, as I raised my hands. Both of them were hesitant to come out, which I could understand, but eventually, they slowly crawled out. Both of them looked to be wearing nothing but small tunics, and had no footwear, to protect their feet, from the blood that covered the ground. Still with my hands slightly up, and with my palms facing them, I let a wide smile appear on my face, to put the kids at ease. Hello there, I said, with a chuckle. Neither of them said anything, and instead, their eyes slowly started to look around the gore-covered church. Not wanting them to be completely messed up from their experiences of the last day, I slowly moved to them and put my hands on their shoulders, which did gain their attention. Let's get the two of you out of here HMM. I said to the two quiet boys, as I picked them up, one with each arm, and took them outside. Both boys seemed to be brothers, both had shaggy sand blonde hair, with light blue eyes. The only difference was one of them looked to be just a year older than the other, maybe around five years old. Stepping through the still open wooden door, I brought both boys out, and into the light of day. Both of the boys scrunched their faces at the bright light, as I brought them into the open. Walking to the side of the church so the dead bodies that littered the street of the village wouldn't be in their view, I set them down. There you go, I said, as their feet hit the ground. Looking at them both, I could see the dark rings that hung under their eyes, showing their exhaustion. I bet both of you are hungry hey? I asked them. Both of the boys nodded their heads at my words. Right, I said, wishing I had brought my pack with me. Looking around again, I knew for a fact, that there wouldn't be any other survivors of this village, including the two boys' parents. Okay look I said, regaining their attention. We are going to my camp, I have food and a place for you to sleep there okay. I said to them, but both boys seemed too tired to even hear my words. Right. I said, as I picked the two boys up, and started making my way back to camp. I wanted to run, but at my fast speed. I was just as likely to accidentally break their necks than anything, so instead I started a light jog. Thankfully the camp was only a little over ten miles from the village, and gave me time to think about what I had just seen. So the wolves didn't come from that village, but instead, came from somewhere else. I thought. That village's population, at max, was a little over one hundred. And from the massacre from inside the church, I could tell, no less than half the village was killed there alone while a good number littered the road, meaning the rest were probably killed in their homes. All of this slightly worried me. Where are they coming from? When I saw the village, I was hoping to find an empty village, which would have meant that the village is where the werewolf virus had broken out, but since the wolves came from somewhere else, that could be a problem. Who knew if there were wolves who separated from the group to infect others, and spread the lycanthrope virus? As I ran I looked down at the two boys who were in my arms. Both of them were sound asleep, with their heads resting on my shoulders. A pang of sadness ran through me at the idea of these two young children having to experience what they must have. Both of them, in the cupboard, having to hear everyone they ever knew being torn apart by beasts. That I couldn't even imagine, and something I hoped, their minds to forget. Chapter 62, Are You Who You Say? While I jogged through the forest at a steady speed, as to not wake the children. My mind began to wander again. Slipping to last night's events. No, 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 no. Henry said, while shaking his head side to side, and crossing his arms over his chest, as I lifted the large piece of flaming wood in my hand. It be the work of the devil. Henry said, with anger. Oh this imbecile. I mentally shouted. You still don't believe me. I questioned, in a strained voice, as I gestured to the flaming red-hot piece of wood, I had gripped in my hand. No, I don't, it be the dark arts. Henry snarled, in anger as he watched Adam drop the wood back into the fire. How is that the dark arts, hmm, I'll tell you, it isn't the dark arts you stubborn prick. I said in anger. Continuing before he could continue his rant. Should I drive my blade through my chest, oh wait, that too you would believe a trick of the dark arts, because your faith is not strong, and the work of God is not clear to you. I said hoping to use a lack of faith for the reason he thought it was the dark arts. You question my faith. Henry squealed, at my words in anger. That I do. I said. Henry started blustering in anger and fury, 
unable to get a word past his tongue. See, you cannot even speak to defend your faith, is it you who is an agent of evil, come to sway your friend away from the light? I said, gesturing to John, who had been sitting quietly, since I had pulled the log from the fire. No that's not. Not what? Not what you meant, your faith is so lacking, you wouldn't believe me no matter what I did. I said as I shook my head, in disappointment, using all of my acting skill to make me seem truly disappointed. Looking at John the first said. Has your friend always been such a non-believer, a heretic to Christianity? I questioned the bewildered John. John sat stunned at my words, unable to speak, at the implications that his friend, the one he had known all of his life, might be an agent of evil, a worshipper of the devil. Henry, an agent of hell, is it possible? John wondered, as he replayed every memory he could remember that had Henry in it. John turned his head to look at his friends. Henry. John asked, in a questioning tone. What, I am no agent of evil. Henry tried to explain. But Adam just showed us proof that he is the Adam, just like the Bible said, when he gave Adam the mark, it made him immortal, and unable to be wounded, look at his hand, there be ash, but there be no burns. John said, gesturing to where I stood by the fire. True, but the Bible also said, Adam has white hair, his is a light black color, and then there is the mark he placed on the Adam from the Bible. Henry said, raising one of fingers to point at me. Uh huh. I thought, in annoyance, knowing I would need to wash out my hair dye, which thankfully, was at the end of its life, and could easily be scrubbed out. Thinking quickly, I spoke again. My hair is white, I just need to wash the fake color from it, and there is no mark, at least one you can see. I told them as I undid my braided hair. At the moment my hair wasn't as long as it had been in past years, which was to my waist, instead, my hair now was in a simple long braid that went down my back, and stopped in between my shoulder blades. Originally, I wanted to shave the sides of my head, to give me a more rouge look, but from the look Julius had given me when I told him, I could tell he didn't think the same as I did, and instead mumbled out barbarian, as he left me to think on his remark. But what does he know? Julius was cut from the cloth of high society, unlike myself, who couldn't care less about social status, or the faux pas of the high class, who in my opinion, was nothing but a bunch of rich medieval redneck hillbillies. Although not as bad as he once might have been, Julius still harbored a sense of his past life, where his father was a relatively prosperous merchant, where he grew up in the upper escalon of Roman citizenship, where riches and finery, was a standard of life for him. But, I decided to just wait and cut the sides of my hair maybe when I'm on my way home, I should do it, just to be an annoyance to the little shit. While I was lost in thought, I hadn't paid attention to John and Henry who were currently in a heated debate. John slash Henry POV. Did you see what he did? John whispered to Henry. Of course I did, I'm right next to you, and had my eyes as wide as you when he did it. Henry whispered back. Looking at Adam for a moment, John turned to look at Henry who was also now looking at the young man who was untying his hair braid. And you still don't believe that he is the Adam. John whispered to Henry. Henry let out a snort of derision. Nay, he isn't him, it is impossible. Henry said simply. John turned to face Henry again. How would you know? John asked flatly. It is simply impossible that the two of us could accidentally be employed by the first man created by God. Henry said, condescendingly. I say there is a good chance that we could, who's to say God did not put this in our path? as some sort of test to help him John said seriously. Help him, John, we don't even know if this is him or not, from the smell of blood coming from the forest, and the noise from his battle, I doubt there is much help we could possibly give him. Henry said angrily. True, but he said his hair is white, and from the look of it he intends to prove it so. John said, as he looked at Adam who had moved to the cart and started washing his hair, with the water from one of the many skins they had brought on the journey as well as some sort of weird thing that they later learned was called a sponge. If his hair is truly white, it must be him. How many others have you seen with white hair? John pushed. Henry grimaced. None, he said in an unhappy voice. They continued to watch Adam wash his hair, using the wet sponge to scrub his hair. But unfortunately for them with only the light from the fire, which had died down since the start of the attack, they could barely make out Adam's figure, let alone the color of his hair. Leaning close to John, Henry whispered. He could be doing some sort of spell, or magic to change his hair. John looked at Henry. 
No matter what he says, you won't believe him will you? John said, with a hint of anger lacing his words. Before letting him speak John continued. We are going on a crusade, how many agents of evil would go on a crusade to the Holy Land, hmm? He asked. And again, John continued before Henry had time to get out a word. So how about you stop guessing, and let his actions speak for him, because from what I have seen not too long ago, was that he killed monsters from hell. If he was an agent of hell, why would he need to attack them, hmm, oh yes, he wouldn't need to, because he would be working with them. John said, with snark, while slowly getting louder and angrier, as Adam's words crept into his mind. The idea that his lifelong friend might be trying to misguide him, down a possible path of evil. Henry opened his mouth for a rebuttal, when he was cut off by the crunching sound of Adam's approach. Both John and Henry turned and watched as Adam slowly made his way into the light. The first thing they saw was Adam's physique. All of his six-three, chunk of hunk, walked into the camp, while he used his once clean and dry tunic to dry his hair. By God man, what is the matter with your body? Henry said in bewilderment. Adam looked down at himself confused. What? He asked, as he continued to dry his head. Your body, it looks funny. John said, as his eyes stared up and down Adam's muscular swimmer's body physique. Never before had either John, or Henry seen such muscles before. Adam looked down, then back up at the two men, one skinny as a pole, and the other a bit chubby, clearly neither were the fit types. This is what it looks like, when you have a steady diet and work hard. Adam said as he pointed at himself. But we are getting off topic again, and it's getting late, and I would like to start tracking the werewolves at first light. Adam said, before removing his makeshift towel from his head. I don't know how much of the dye I was able to get out, but from what I can see, I managed to take out most of it. Adam said as he combed through his white hair with his fingers. John hit Henry in the arm when he saw the white hair, and said. See, I told you. Without looking away from Adam, Henry returned the hit and said. And I said, it could still be magic. He said. You are just too slow-minded to see the truth when it's right in front of you, I have half a mind to believe his words are true and you truly are working with hell. John said, finally looking away from Adam, to give Henry one of his best skulls. Adam POV. I let out a sigh, realizing Henry still didn't believe me, while John did. But all I could do at this point was shrug, I was too tired, and at this point didn't really care anymore, to try and change his mind. So, while John and Henry bickered back and forth, I saw the corpse of the werewolf I had hit into the camp by accident, laying on the ground dead, near my blanket. Not wanting it to start stinking up, next to where I was going to sleep. I walked over to the body and grabbed one of its back legs, and dragged it just into the forest, before dropping the leg. As I pulled the body to the woods, I was able to see the piles of bodies, scattering the thick forest floor, like a strange carpet of werewolf fur. We're gonna need to burn the bodies tomorrow, and move our camp. I thought as I turned around to leave. Making my way back to camp, I could still hear the two still going back and forth. I decided we had had enough of that, so once I was standing by the fire watching the two bicker, I clapped my hands together, managing to gain their attention. Look, as much as I would like for the two of you to figure out, whatever it is you two are bickering about, I'm tired and need some sleep, so could we at least stow it until tomorrow? I asked them, angrily. Both of them looked up at me, neither saying a word. Satisfied with the silence, I clasped my hands together. Great. I said, with a fake smile, before going off to my own blanket for some well-deserved sleep. Breaking from my thoughts as I finally neared our new camp spot, which was half a mile from the still smoldering bodice of the werewolves. I let out a small sigh, as I looked down to see the two boys still dead asleep. Slowing down, I started to walk the last hundred feet, until the camp came into sight. Where I could see John sitting on the ground near the fire, while the shape of Henry could be seen asleep, even though it was almost noon. Lazy, must have gone to sleep after I left, but at least one of them decided to stay awake and on watch I thought, as I got closer. The new camp was closer to the road, with forest on three sides, and a road about twenty feet from one side of the camp, instead of our old camp, which was farther into the forest, in a small clearing. When John saw me, he stood quickly. Who are they? He asked me loudly, once I had come closer. SHHH I said, as I tilted my head to the two sleeping children in my arms. Who are they? 
he asked again, with a sheepish look. Ignoring him, I walked past him, to my own bed roll, which either John or Henry had put out after I had left, to lay both of the boys down. The older boy was easy, but the smaller boy, seemed to not want to let go, and instead, unconsciously wrapped his arms around my neck, unwilling to let go. For as old as I am, I had almost no experience dealing with small people, or I mean children, but to me, they are small people, only without all the baggage adults carry around. Thankfully after a moment, the small boy's grip lessened, and I was able to lay him on the blanket, next to his brother. Chapter 63, Breakfast So, they were all that was left of the village. John asked, as he turned to look at the two sleeping kids. Yet. Yeah. I said simply. I can only imagine how they will be when they wake up. They were still in shock when I found them. I said, as I broke off a piece of a twinge I had been toying with, and threw it into the fire. Shock. John asked, confused, turning to look at me. Yeah, you know. I said, twirling my hand around. How the hell do I explain shock in a way he might understand? It's what happens when someone sees something, or goes through a traumatic incident, it's called acute stress reaction, and it is a type of shock, it's categorized as a psychological shock, which can cause a multitude of emotional problems. I said, while mindlessly distracted while looking into the fire. Not hearing anything from John, I turned to look at him. John's face was a mask of pure confusion. Shit, forgot to put all of that in layman's terms. Uh, it's just a word to explain when someone is acting strange after something scary. I said, giving John a smile, while I let out a sigh on the inside. Ah how I miss the old Greek days, when smart people were of a plenty, and I could use big words around them, without being looked at like I'm the idiot. Well that's not right, some of the words I myself just used were even out of their league. Ah, now I see, why couldn't you have just said that from the start, instead of talking gibberish? John said with a chuckle. I couldn't tell ye. I said, with a chuckle. So, what now? John asked, as he used a stick to move some of the wood in the fire around. Now, we need to find out where these werewolves are coming from. Is that the name of them creatures that attacked us? He asked me. Yes, they are humans who turn during the full moon into feral mindless beasts. They were human. John asked me, shocked, and surprised. They are human. I corrected him. What I said, confused. I turned away from the fire and looked at him. They are still humans, but, when the moon is at its fullest, they change into half-humans, half-wolves, with incredible strength and speed, that you would never know you died if one ever came after you. I said, as I watched the color drain from his face. Before I could continue. I was interrupted by a loud fart that caused both John and I to turn our heads to the side, only to see a stretching Henry, as he rolled on his blanket finally waking up from his long nap. That's disgusting. What are you trying to do, suffocate us? I said, as my overly strong nose smelled Henry's foul-smelling gas, causing me to pinch my nose closed. Henry shot upright at my voice. You're back. He said loudly, as he looked at me. SHHH I said, pointing at the sleeping children. Henry's head turned, until he caught sight of the children. Henry's head tilted to the side as he saw them then looked at me in confusion. Are you stealing children now to eat their innocent souls? He whispered, open-mouthed and in shock. I gave him a flat look, and from the corner of my eye, I saw John doing the same. There you go, with the assumptions again. John said beside me. Asso assumption. Henry said, stumbling over the word John had just used. I, assumption, it's a word Adam taught me this morning. John said with a smug look of satisfaction on his face, at the idea that he was in any way smarter and therefore better than his friend. What does it mean? Henry angrily whispered. An assumption is a belief or proposition that is taken for granted or accepted as true without any proof or evidence. It is a fundamental element in reasoning and decision-making, as it forms the basis for making predictions, drawing conclusions, and forming opinions. Assumptions can be based on personal experiences, cultural norms, logical reasoning, or even biases. They are often made unconsciously and can influence our thoughts, actions, and perceptions of the world around us. I said. Henry looked at me strangely as I spoke the words. Wah. He said, as his brain tried, and failed, to grasp my words. Right, layman's terms. In simple terms, 
an assumption is something we believe to be true without having any solid evidence or proof. It's like making a guess or taking a guess about something without really knowing for sure. We often make assumptions based on what we think is true or what we expect to happen, but they may not always be accurate. Assumptions can influence how we think, make decisions, and understand the world, but it's important to be aware of them and question whether they are actually true or not. I said, in what I thought was a level, they could understand. I had an idea, to smarten the two of them up, along our travels, in a hope, that maybe the two of them could actually do something useful with themselves besides, well being my servants. What can I say, I'm a fan of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, and I would love to see them do better with their lives. Right, I still don't get it. Henry said, still confused. We will work on it. I said as I shook my head. But for now, I'm starving. I continued, standing to my feet, and making my way towards the cart. Approaching the cart, I saw our horse tied to a tree, while munching on the grass at his feet, only a few feet from the side of the large wooden cart. Finally at the cart, I dug into the full bags that filled the cart, and took out the needed pans for our lunch. Setting them by the fire, I silently went back to the cart, and grabbed the food fans. In one bag was some fresh meat, while in the other, was the greens and seasonings. Setting all of it by the fire, I set one of the flat pan on some of the red coals of the fire. While the pan heated, I opened the bag of meats, and pulled out a wrapped bundle. This one, was of pork belly, or otherwise known as bacon. In total I had a little over three pounds of just bacon, in this bag, which should last us, until we got to another town or village that sells meat. Opening the seasoning bag, I pulled out a small wooden jar, which held the butter, and took out about one tablespoon worth, and tossed it onto the heating pan to melt, so the bacon wouldn't stick to the pan. Once the butter was melted, and moved around the pan, I started laying cuts of bacon onto the pan. As soon as the meat hit the pan, it instantly started to fizzle and pop. And within moments the delicious smoky smell started to fill our camp. Oh my, now that's a smell. Henry said, as he inhaled a lung full of air. Agreed. John said, as he licked his lips. Grabbing another pan. I set it next to the already popping bacon pan, and put on some putter to melt. John turned to Henry and whispered. Why is he doing all the cooking all of the sudden, aren't we supposed to be the ones to cook? Henry shrugged. MHM, he never complained about our cooking, but look at the way he is doing it. I say we don't say anything and let him finish. His cooking just smells too good, and I want to try it. Now with the other pan done, I pulled out a few eggs and cracked the open on the pan, and poured the yolk into the pan. As I was doing that, I saw some rustling coming from my bed roll. Looking up from what I was doing, I saw the smaller boy sitting up from where he had been sleeping, and rubbing his eyes. The boy looked around in confusion, at his surroundings, then over at us. Dropping the egg shell that was in my hand. Unsure if he would remember me. I lifted my hands and said in old French. Friend, remember. The boy slowly nodded his head at my words. Ah, good, good. I said in a friendly manner, as I used my fingers to flip the bacon. I'm sure you are hungry, why don't you come over, and have some. I said, giving the boy a big smile. The boy's eyebrows went up, as his nose picked up the appetizing smell of the bacon. Slowly, the boy stood to his feet, and came closer to the fire. As he came closer, I was reminded of the bad state of both of the boys, as I saw the dirty tunic the boy wore, and the lack of footwear the boy had. Once close to the fire, the boy sat down on the grass ground, next to the fire, but still, I could tell the cool air made him shiver. Standing up, I went to the cart, and grabbed two extra blankets we had brought, as spares. Laying one on his still sleeping brother, I wrapped the other around him. Once done with that, I went to the cart, and brought out some plates. Turning around, I saw both John and Henry leaning over the pans that had the almost done food in it. I, back away, that's not for you two, if the two of you want food, you can cook it for yourselves. But but but. John complained. It smells so good. Henry finished for his friend. And I said, it's not for you, the two of you are grown men, you can cook for yourselves, that's for me and the kids. I said, shooing them away with one of the plates. Both of them backed away, with sullen expressions. Our antics made the little kid giggle, as he saw me shoe both grown men. Turning to the kid, I gave him a little smile, while thinking. That must be a good sign. 
I don't know the first thing about someone's mental health after traumatic incidents, but if he could laugh, that must be good, I think. Now with the plates, I slid three pieces of bacon onto a plate, as well as one attempt at a sunny side egg, but it didn't exactly turn out how I had hoped, and instead had broken apart on the pan when I tried to move it to a plate. Once the plate had the incredible smelling food on it. I bought it to the boy. And here you are sir, one full plate. The boy's eyes were wide in shock, as he looked over the plate. Enjoy. I said, turning to make another plate for the still sleeping boy, and myself. Chapter 64, The Hunt Begins Sitting around the fire, I finished off the last of my own plate while John and Henry had just started to cook their own food. At the moment, both of the boys were still inhaling away at their own food, like vacuums. Setting my plate to the side, I turned to look at the two kids. Oh, I nearly forgot to ask. What are your names? I asked them. Both of them looked up at me, with nervousness. Wanting to ease the tension, I decided to speak first. I'll go first, my name is Adam. I said with a smile. Picking up on what I was trying to say, John spoke in English. Yeah, he's the Adam you know the one from THO that hurt John cut in, before I tossed my plate at his head to shut him up. Quiet I told him, giving him a you talk, and I'll hit you again, look. Neither of them can understand you, but that doesn't mean you can go about telling everyone and their mother who I am. I chided him. Our actions made both of the kids laugh at our squabble, and ease up, but only a little. Turning back to them, I gave them another smile. The first to talk was the older brother. My name is Gerard, and this is my younger brother Olivier. Gerard said, pointing to his little brother, who was just finishing off the last scraps of food on his plate. Well it is nice to meet the both of you. I said, giving them both another one of my best smiles. Now that both of them were done eating, I gathered the plates and gave them to John and Henry to take care of. Now seated again, I spoke again. Not wanting to, but not having a choice, I asked the questions that had been on my mind since this morning, when I saw the town. What do the two of you remember about last night? I asked tentatively. The younger boy, Olivier, turned his head down, and clasped his small hands together at my words in fear, as he clearly remembered the events of the precious night. But again, his older brother, who was at most six or seven, was the first to speak. We don't know much. He said, sadly. I remember our father waking us from sleep, when it was still dark outside. He carried us to the church. People were screaming. He said, then stopped, as he remembered. We made it to the church. Father Philippe was rushing people inside, then, then, he put some wood in the way of the doors. People were scared. He said, stammering out what he could remember. Then people started to scream again in the church, that is when our father took us to the side of the church, to the, the. He said, trying to remember what it was called. I know what you are talking about, it's called a cupboard. I said. The boy nodded his head. Yes, that. He brought us to the cupboard, and put us in there, while we heard the people in the church scream, someone inside was attacking people, then our father closed the doors, and all we could hear were the screaming people. Gerard said, his eyes glossed over, as the memories of what he could remember flooded his mind. Looking at the two boys whose minds had become places of mental torment, I couldn't help, but feel bad for them. Standing up, I walked to the two boys, crouched down, and put my hands on their shoulders. Me doing so, seemed to break them from their memories, as they both looked up at me. It's okay. I said in a reassuring manner, not knowing what else to do. For an adult I might be able to say something to help, but all of this was new to me. Kids saw the world differently than adults, at least I think they do. And my words may not help them the way they might for an adult. My words seemed to help a little, as the older boy, Gerard nodded his head, while Olivier sat there still looking down at his clenched hands. Sitting back down, I started to go over what Gerard had just said, but the church in particular. Someone was attacking people inside the church. I thought. There was someone in the church who wanted the werewolves to come in. But why? Who in their right mind would let, what was to then demons in? Satanic cultists was a thing I had heard about only a few times across the ages, and normally as soon as the word of one spread, towns and villagers would pick up their pitchforks, and torches, and kill all who were suspected of being part of such groups, innocent or not. But could it have been just some deranged cultists in the church? 
doubtful. There had to have been no less than fifty people in that church, no normal man could possibly take on that many, unless they were supernatural. My brain shot to the door of the church. I remembered that it was still perfectly intact, and in no way was damaged, so either what was in there did kill everyone and simply left, or the person inside somehow managed to open the door, and let in the werewolves. If it was a cult working with the werewolves, that could be a real problem. They could enter a village pretending to be a traveler the day before the attack, then when the attack starts, they act like any other scared person, and sneak into any safe place the villagers go, the cultists could open anything to get in their way. MMMM, no, the werewolves I fought were too strong, there's no wooden door, bared or not, that could keep them out, so that can't be right. I thought, as I scratched my chin, while blocking out the loud munching sounds of John and Henry as they ate their food. Could it be that there was already a werewolf inside the church? No, the church was too small for one to hide. I thought, answering my own question. Maybe it was an unchanged werewolf. That thought stalled me. Werewolves can't control their shifting. As soon as the full moon rises, they become mindless beasts, and kill anything and everything they come across. But could it be possible? I thought. Werewolves were new to me, never before had I run into them before, and in all honesty, I didn't know they existed in this world in the first place, except the shapeshifters from Forks, Washington. So recalling the memories from my past life, I went over what I still could remember about werewolves. Werewolf lore is different in different places. Some mythologies believe werewolves can control their shifting while some believe it is uncontrollable, during the full moon. And personally, I have to side with the involuntarily shifting, because anything with at least a smudge of sense, would have known not to continue attacking me, like the werewolves yesterday. Even though I killed all that had come before them with clear ease, they continued to attack me. But, there is still the chance that there are some that can control their shifting. Perhaps this world has werewolf alphas. I thought as my brain went over that possibility. And one thing that was still possible, was the chance some who are bitten, have some sort of genetic difference than the rest of the werewolves, that allow them to be stronger faster and to control when they shift without losing their minds. And a part of me let out a sigh as I thought of this. That's all I need, stronger and faster werewolves, who are already as fast as vampires. I thought. But there was also another part of me that knew this was all speculation, so I shouldn't be complaining yet. But still, even the thought sucked. Because all I wanted was a peaceful, easy life, with a smidgen of adventure. And yet, shit just keeps falling in my lap, for me to deal with. Turning to John and Henry, I spoke. I'm gonna take a nap, and will be gone for a few hours tonight, so the both of you will need to look out for the kids. I said, standing to my feet, and making my way towards the cart, where I planned to sleep, while leaving my bedroll to the kids. My nap was peacefully uninterrupted, and when I woke, it was already starting to get dark. Getting out of the cart, where I had used one of the bags of grain as a pillow, I saw Henry and John both seated around the fire while they talked to each other. Stepping into the light of the fire, both of their heads snapped up to look at me. Oh it's just you. Henry said, letting out a breath of air. Yes it's just me. I said, with a chuckle, at the two skittish men, as I looked over at the two boys who were sound asleep, wrapped under their blankets. Walking close to the fire, where both John and Henry were seated, I grabbed a water skin that had been laid close to the fire to heat. I uncorked the top, and down a few mouthfuls of the warm water, to quench my thirst. Putting the top back into the water skin, I laid it back where it had been, then spoke to John and Henry, who were sitting silently while watching me. I'm going to be gone for a while. I said, simply. Where are you going? John asked. Hunting. I said with a chuckle. Continuing before they could speak. I need to find out more about these werewolves. I said. Earlier I was thinking about the attacked village, and I don't think it was just circumstance that there were that many werewolves that just got together and attacked that village. Wait, you believe the attack was planned? Henry asked. I do. The church is what is giving me the most trouble. I said, going over what I had thought about earlier again in my head. Church? Henry asked. Oh right. Neither of you could understand what Gerard said when we were talking. Gerard. John asked. I let out a sigh. Did neither of you try to talk to the boys? I asked. Of course we tried, but they didn't want to talk to us. Henry said, with a peeved tone. I shook my head, 
and decided to deal with that when I got back. Look, the older boy is named Gerard, while the younger one is named Olivier. I said. Now back to what I had been saying, actually on second thought it's not important to either of you. I said, shaking my head, and turning around to walk back to the cart. Trying to explain everything to them would just be a waste of time. I thought as I walked to the cart. While John and Henry looked at each other with raised brows. Once to the cart, I rummaged around for a few minutes, until I found what I had been looking for. Pulling out one of the extra swords I had brought along, I walked back to the camp. Stopping by John, I held out the extra sword. Here I said, holding out the sword for him to take. John looked at the sword in confusion, and didn't take it. Uh, what, what am I supposed to do with that? He said, looking at the sword. You're supposed to take it. I said, shaking the sword, to indicate for him to take the sword. And slowly he did so, while the look of confusion stayed on his face. It's for protection while I'm gone. I said. For protection John said, his look of confusion gone, and now he took on a look of trepidation, mixed with concern. Looking around him, John spoke again in a whisper. Do you think we might be attacked while you are gone? I shook my head. No, but it's always better to be safe than sorry. Why does he get the sword? Henry asked. Because I trust him more than I trust you. I said, turning to look at him. Going back to the cart, I grabbed my own sword, and belted it on, then went back to the fire to give my last warning. Stepping back to the fire, I could hear John and Henry arguing about the sword. Henry shut it. I gave John the sword, so stop being a baby, and accept it. I said sternly. But, if it makes you feel better, here. I said, tossing a dagger I had strapped to my belt to him. I practically never used the dagger, unless I was cutting meat, so it wasn't important to me. Henry caught the sheath dragged in his hands, and wasted no time, pulling it from the sheath, to look at the blade. Don't go waving that about, it's very sharp, and can hurt people. I said giving him another stare, until he resheathed the dagger, and set it in his lap. Good, I said. Looking over at the two sleeping kids one last time, I looked back at John and Henry. No matter what, protect them if something happens, they have already had a hard life, and seen more than anyone should, the last thing they need now is more trauma. Also try to learn their language or teach them English. I said, before leaving, to hunt some wolves. Now away from the camp. I started running full speed. Following the tracks I had followed earlier today. But now I was no longer looking for anything that might stick out to me, and now I just ran full speed in the direction of the town, where I could track where the werewolves had come from. It only took me 30 minutes to reach the desolate town, where as I passed, I could still see a few bodies of the villagers. Circling the town, it wasn't hard to find which direction the wolves had come from. I followed the tracks, through thick forest, and brush that was mostly trampled by the wolves. Chapter 65, Attacking Leaving the camp, I followed the path of trampled brush and plants I had followed earlier, which led me to the dark village that was void of life. As I passed the village, I could see in the full moon's light, the dead bodies of a few villagers, and a feeling of sadness ran through me. All they tried to do in this life was survive. I thought, as I ran past the village, and pushed that feeling down. That's the world for you. Everyone dies eventually, they just died earlier than most, and in a gruesome way. Once on the other side of the village. I started to look for the signs of where the werewolves came from. It wasn't hard to find it, or them. I found two separate paths that seemed to be where they came from. Both on separate sides of the village. Following one of them, I saw that the two paths came together to one main path. Hmm, they separated. I thought. But how? They wouldn't have thought to do that. As soon as they found something living, they would have attacked, not thought to separate then attack from two sides. I thought, as the idea that they were being led grew stronger in my head. Now following the main track, I followed it up, and into some thick forest. As I followed the path, it eventually led into a dell. The bottom of the dell was rocky, and made my footsteps loud and crunchy. Not wanting to be heard, I quickly made it up one side of the dell, and back into the forest where I followed the dell from the side, as well as the scent of the werewolves. The dell went on for about a quarter of a mile, before it stopped, and opened out, into a rocky river bed that looked to be mostly dried up. Now without a direct path, I used my smell, to follow their scent. 
left I thought, as I took in a deep smell through my nose. Now again with their direction, I followed. The dried up river bed went on for a few miles, and curved left and right. But eventually I smelled their scent change direction. As I turned to follow, I went completely still. In the distance, the sound of howls rang out. At first it was only a few, but slowly, more and more started to join in, until it sounded like hundreds of wolves were howling. Shit! I thought, as the howls started to die down. Now with a confirmed direction to head in, I took off, running full speed. My plan was to kill all of them quickly, and not let any get away to infect more, also to hopefully find out who the hell was leading them. I ran for close to ten minutes at full speed, when the first signs of werewolves became clear. The closer I got to where I heard the howls coming from, the stronger the smell of decaying meat and dog started to fill my nose. Then the sound of rumbling could be heard. Slowing down, I listened for a few moments. The rumbling wasn't getting closer, and it wasn't getting farther away, which confused me. Slowing down more, I got closer to the sound. As I passed under a rather large tree, I came to the edge of a large clearing, and promptly cursed my bad luck. In the clearing, from what I could see, was no less than 700 werewolves, all running in one massive counterclockwise circle. What the fuck? I thought, as I watched them go around and around. Unable to see the true number of them, I climbed the large tree that was next to me. As I reached close to the top, I was finally able to see everything. My original guess at how many werewolves there were was wrong, way wrong. What I saw was had multiple layers to it. On the outside, there was a thin line of werewolves going counterclockwise, maybe five or six hundred werewolves, but closer to the center was another large group of werewolves going clockwise, at least another five hundred. But what really caught my attention was what was in the middle of the horde. In the middle was a massive cloaked figure. Who was doing some sort of strange dance, where he turned in circles with his hands straight up to the moon, that hung overhead. Wait claws. I thought, as I squinted my eyes to get a better look at the figure. As I looked closer, I was able to get a good look at the figure's hands. And like I thought I saw, both of them were clawed, with wicked sharp points, and thick fingers that they were connected to. What the fuck is that? I thought, as I continued to watch on. For another few minutes I continued to watch, but whatever was happening didn't seem to have an ending in sight. It doesn't really matter what they are doing, they are dead anyhow I thought, as I stood from my crouch. Opening my menu screen, I decided to pump myself up for the fight that was about to take place. Scrolling through some of my playlist, I searched for the perfect song. Ah, there you are, you beauty. I said, chuckling to myself, as it started to play in my head. King for a day pierce the veil. Pulling my sword from my side, I let the music fill my head, while a smile came to my face as I looked down at the circling horde. In my free left hand, I let a ball of purple energy grow, until it was the size of a volleyball. As soon as it was the right size, I hurled it at the horde. Leaping after it a split second later. As the orb hit the werewolves, it caused a massive shockwave to go in all directions, throwing a number of werewolves back, and creating a creator nearly a foot deep, and five feet wide. Landing in the creator, I slowly stood up and looked around at the werewolves that started to circle me, as an evil smile crept across my face, while the werewolves started to snarl and gnash their teeth at me. Well, let's not stand around all day, let's get this party started. I shouted, as I covered my blade in the purple aura. For a split second before the wolves charged me, I couldn't help but feel giddy, as I stood surrounded by no less than two thousand werewolves, with a glowing purple sword. Try this mace windu I thought, just as all of wolves charged me at the same time. Jumping into the air, I let the werewolves clash into each other, while I let loose another orb blast from above. Turning those in the direct blast into red mist, while those close to the blast were sent flying back to become tangled with the other werewolves who were trying to get at me. Landing back to the ground, I let loose. Letting my sword take off heads and different limbs with every swing of my sword. Every now and then I would let off a blast in different directions to keep myself from being swamped. Because unlike my last fight with the werewolves who came at me in one direction, I was now being attacked in all directions, making it harder for me to block some blows. As the song playing in my head hit a rather intense moment, I truly lost myself in the fight. Swinging my sword so fast it really started to look like a lightsaber. Twirling mid-air to avoid a strike from behind, I managed to get a view over the battlefield, and managed to get another view of the cloaked figure, who was still dancing. Landing back down, 
I decided to figure out who or what the hell this person is. A slash N. A bit of a short chapter, and without a doubt probably has some issues, but I just wanted to post this, so people don't start to think I dropped the FIC, which I haven't. I'm currently in the process of moving into a new house, and it has been insanely stressful, having to get water, electricity and Wi-Fi working, as well as having to clean and fix the place up a bit. All in all, it has been a massive time distraction, that has kept me from having the energy or the time to write. But things are starting to get back to normal, so I will hopefully be posting chapters again soon. Oh and the reason I was posting on my other FIC was because those were already written chapters and I just posted them. Thanks for listening. <laughs>